This is the Arctic Liquid Freezer 3 in 360 and in ARGB and very similar to the Liquid Freezer 240 video. I do not want to waste anybody's time except for the benchmark section and the conclusion. Everything that I am going to say was already said in the 240 video. So if you've already watched that or you have watched the LF2, LF3 420 video, you can skip to this timestamp here. And if you want to understand why there are two LF3 420 results, skip a little bit less far to here. Yeah. Let's get going. The Liquid Freezer 3 360 exists in three variants, a 360 in black, a 360 in black and with ARGB, which is the one we have benchmarked today, and a white version full of RG poop. Technically, all of them should be performing somewhat the same, but in reality, of course, they are not. They, they just can't. The Arctic P12s and P12 ARGBs are not precisely the same fans. The ARGBs are spinning slightly faster and they've got that ring going around the impella. Of course, not to forget the performance enhancing ARGB, of course. That said, the difference is not big enough to make it worth a full video. So there are going to be differences, but such small ones that it won't make it out of the margin of error. Now, the LF3 is definitely something special. We got a 38 millimeter thick radiator paired with three up to 2000 RPM quick spinning P12 ARGBs, which can push up to 48.82 CFM at up to one 0.85 millimeters of H2O of static pressure. And compared to the previous generation Liquid Freezer 2, it's not like Arctic just reused old radiators. They came up with new stuff. Like the Gen 3 Reds are now 1 FPI denser at 15 and the fins themselves go deeper into the whole block. Or in other words, the gap between the shroud where the fans are being attached to and where the fins begin has become significantly smaller. Hence, we have more cooling area while the AIO hasn't become any thicker. The other major improvement can be found on the block. There we got the new Arctic Circle of Cooling, which is a way better description than ugly as spaceship. Anyway, the thing sits on top of the water block pump combo and is supposed to cool down the VR ramps around the CPU. This is nothing new. The LF2 had the ugly spaceship and we have a bunch of other AIOs which have a, a similar thing that somehow cools the VR ramp, but it has now become significantly bigger. Unfortunately, the fact that the whole combo is round does not mean that all of the area is occupied by a fan. In fact, the fan sits in there and it is much 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 smaller. It takes up a fraction of the space, though on the other hand it is like a 35 millimeter thick fan, which is impossible to measure given it is inside of there, but it is a, a really thick fan. Depending on your exact combo, that fan can do more or can do less. It can be more or less useful, but it's always going to be better to have that fan and cool down the VRM around the CPU than to just not have it. And across all Liquid Freezer 3s, that part is just identical. So to take out a few pages out of the LF3420's review, we benchmarked that thing on our usual Intel benchmark machine using the 320 watts preset. And compared with the second gen Liquid Freezer 2, we saw the VRM temps drop by 11.5 instead of 3.9, 6 instead of 2.7, and 13 instead of 5.3 degrees C, depending on the VRM sensor that we were looking at. And overall, the difference that this thing, the small fan can make, the difference is huge. That's not to say that not having that fan will make your PC light on fire, no. But having it, it can, or in our instance, dropped a sensor by uh, um, something where a sensor can pick it up by 13 degrees. So. Yeah, the fan has a huge impact if you have it. Another special thing about this AIO compared to the alternatives is how you connect everything. First up are the two 450mm long tubes, which I appreciate a lot, but hidden inside of them are PWM and 3-pin ARGB cables. You see, by default, the water block pump combo comes without a connection and included in the box of goodies, we get these two cables. One of them ends in a single 4-pin PWM plug and a 3-pin ARGB plug if we have the ARGB edition. And if we remove the magnetically attached water block pump combo, yes, it is super useful that it is magnetically attached and the ARGB comes through in, in a pushpin fashion, so that's really useful. Anyway, if we remove it, we can connect that cable and route the cable properly so that it doesn't get stuck in between. And the single line cable will now go through the water block pump combo, provide fan power to, and ARGB power to that thing travel within the tubes all the way into the radiator where it is then daisy chained to provide ARGB and fan power to the P12s. And that way we can control the whole AIO using a single plug and that's really freaking useful or two plugs if you have the ARGB edition. But everything, every type of power, type of control is a single plug and that's really freaking useful. And the AIO isn't 
totally done. If you make the whole thing spin extremely slow, it will not mean that the pump will run at, let's say, 10%. There is a document showing what I mean. If you use the single combination cable, the pump has a quite high minimum speed by default, or at least much, much higher than the VRM and the P12. And once you crank up the setting, the pump will max out at about 80% of your setting, which does not mean that the pump will max out at 80%. It means if you tell the AIO, give me 80%, the fans will spin, or the big fan, the P12s, will spin at 80%, the pump will already be at 100 But what if you want to control all the individual components independently? That's where this cable comes into play. Instead of controlling everything using a single plug, we now got individual plugs for everything where we can set the speeds as we wish. And we do not need to route every cable to every component. The board on the block combined with all the hidden cables allow us to do everything from this one little short cable. Neat. And the last special thing about these LF3s is how you install them on Intel, because as you probably all know, Intel screwed up their socket mounting, like a lot. And instead of giving us a regular old backplate and a bunch of screws to get this gorgeous copper plate glued to the chip, we are getting a full contact frame to replace the one that bends to a little bit of social pressure. On AMD it's not like that, there is just a bunch of mounting clips and uh, and screws and yeah, th there you go. Out of the box, the Liquid Freezer 3 comes with the before mentioned connection possibilities as well as the installation hardware for the newest two Intel sockets as well as AM5 and AM4. Not particularly backwards compatible, that's true. True, but to be honest, this is also like a very, very high performance AIO when who would install this onto a decade old chip. To get the cooler going on Intel, we need to place the motherboard onto something that provides some back pressure, onto the socket itself please, and make sure that we got the CPU in there already and keep the socket open. From there, use the provided Allen wrench to remove all four socket screws. And yes, it is normal that this feels kind of warranty destroying. And once that's off, we can replace the top and bottom ILM parts with the provided Arctic contact frame with the arrow in the bottom left corner. From there, use the new screws with the Phillips head and screw them in by using an X pattern and only a few turns at a time and continue to do so until everything is screwed down. If you got any issues uh, to have the screws catch the thread, uh, what helped me dozens of times is uh, lift the motherboard, take the, the backplate into my hand and then wiggle it around a bit and then just do it like freehandish. It's yeah, that's the best I can tell you. Over on AMD it's much easier. Remove the original retention brackets, replace them with the spacers, mounting clips on top with L and R being readable and screw everything down. You see how easy it can be if you don't screw up your mounting? It's yeah, thanks AMD. From there on both sockets, thermal paste position the VRM fan less combo at this time onto the chip with the tubes in the bottom, screw it down and reinstall the top cap, which will now go all the way in because the screws aren't blocking it anymore. On the whole installation part, a, a few things. Uh, first off, having the tubes come down in the bottom, that's, that's a design choice. You like it or you don't. Many AIOs do it nowadays, or many. I, I've seen a few come out which have tubes uh, in the bottom. Apparently there's also like a performance thing, but it's a design choice. And the very least, you don't have any VRM interference, but what you can have is M.2 heatsick interference. In some instances, like uh, one of our AMD motherboards, there the M.2 heatsink will just be in the way, so we just can't install that one. That said, nobody is forcing us to install it, but that could be an issue. If you want to be sure that you don't have the issue, there is a compatibility checklist on Arctic's website that you can check out just to be sure before your purchase. For the Intel installation method with a contact frame, I installed the Catrisa 3s now two dozens of times, three dozens of times, many, many times. And I, I not, not even in a single instance did I have a system that did not boot or have any like uh, major heat problem. So the whole thing functions. That said, I do believe that it's a bit much to ask for a first time builder. If somebody has never built a PC and there comes Arctic and tells them, yeah, take half your socket apart. I think that's a bit too much. What I believe Arctic should be doing from uh, for the future is they do now offer the installation mounting kit for older sockets, which by the way is also compatible with the new ones. And I believe they should include that in the box and then tell people, hey, if you do not feel comfortable, just use that. It's way easier, less uh, warranty destroying feeling, and that, that would be a good way forward. That said, let's now talk about why I had to install these Liquid Freezer 3s dozens and dozens and dozens of times. Sometime after the LF3420 review, Arctic did send over all of the other Liquid Freezer 3s. Then I benchmarked them, and for some reason, 
Some of the smaller ones came dangerously close to the original 420, which didn't make any lot of sense, it still doesn't, and if the load was high enough, they even surpassed it, which made even less sense. Then I rebenchmarked the new ones, just to be sure that there was nothing wrong with the system, and no, none of them came outside the margin of error. Right after benchmarking the new ones, I also benchmarked all of them using P12 and P14 Maxes, because these videos are also coming out. Thankfully, I also decided to rebenchmark the original LF3 420 using the original P14 something that I sometimes just do, like with random AIOs or random air coolers, just to be sure that everything is still running fine. And it was not running fine. I benchmarked the 420 many, many times, and every time I remounted everything, and every time the re results became worse. Worse and worse and worse. Like sub-240 AIGB performance at that point. And I just couldn't figure out why. All of the new LF3s did perform roughly as expected. The only outliner was the original LF3 for 20. So I contacted Arctic. I had to send them my unit. I bought a new unit. And then I re-benchmarked that one. And lo and behold, I had a broken unit. Which is now the reason why there is a new Arctic Liquid Freezer 3 for 20 called New Sample. Because as it turns out, my new sample consistently performed about 2 degrees C better than the original did when I first benchmarked it. And if we compare all of the new Liquid Freezer 3 results with the original one, it, it kind of makes me doubt if I did not have a broken unit to begin with. That's a possibility that I now see. Yeah, I think that's even the case. All of that said, I will leave the two LF3 for 20 results in the charts for all the other LF3 reviews, and afterwards the old value will just disappear. So. Please don't tell me in the comments that there are two different results. This is why there are two different results. And with that said, let's get to the Liquid Freezer 3, ARGB, 360, and its benchmark results. First up is Intel, where we benchmark on a 3900K using three presets, 120, 250, and 320 watts. We start at full blast, after which we slowly lower the fan speed in 10% steps, while it's noting down the noise and performance to create a noise to performance curve. The pump is always kept at 100% all the time. At 120 watts, the LF3360 managed to keep the CPU at 28.6 degrees C above Above ambient, which is, yes, it's a very, very good result, but it's also not like 120 watts would be a very good benchmark for an AIO capable of cooling 300 plus watts. The noise to performance at such low power levels is another topic, as many games won't even push your high end CPU that much higher, and the noise to performance line for the LF3360 makes something we've seen a couple of times before a lot of gibberish. Making the fan spin slower and slower didn't really change a whole lot, and averaging the results ended up with this gibberish. This may not make that much sense, but compared to the smaller 240 and bigger 420, it, it starts making sense. It's in between the two. Let's get to some actual load. At 250 watts running through the socket, the LF2360 kept the chip at 54.5 degrees C above ambient, which is an excellent result. It's at the top of the list, though not at the very, very top. The Hyperflow 360 is within margin of error, and slightly above we still got alternatives like the Li and Li AIOs or the thermal iceberg ice flow. The corresponding noise to performance line starts making sense. Again, we got the LF3 and 360 in the middle between the smaller and the bigger one, but now decimating the hyperflow. No matter which noise level you want to equalize the two, the freezer just wins. And this almost also happened compared to the nucleus. EK's AIO might be able to push it slightly higher, but if you normalize it down to the noise created by the LF, the nucleus first loses, and then only starts to take over again between 80 and 70% of the LF3360's max speed. On the flip side, however, the Iceberg Thermal Oasis just flat out wins. That, that thing has like an incredible ratio. At 320 watts, the 360mm Liquid Freezer 3 kept the chip at 74.4 degrees C above ambient, 2.2 behind the slightly bigger 140mm based LF420. Compared to other AIOs, it's good. It's at the top of the list, but similarly to the 250 watts workload, there are still 360mm AIOs above it. The corresponding noise to performance line does however show, once again, if you favor noise over raw performance, there aren't many AIOs around that can beat the LF3. The EK Nucleus is now just sitting behind, period. And the only AIOs that can keep up with this type of ratio are the bigger LF3 for 20 and the ISLO Oasis. Over on AMD we are testing using a 7950X3D where we measure the achieved average clock speed across all cores at every fan speed level whilst noting down the noise at every step giving us a noise to performance curve. Here we might not have as many comparison values, but the point still comes across. The LF3 is glued to the 420 while it's never actually reaching that once noise to performance ratio and while it's keeping a healthy advantage 
to the 240mm model. Interesting here is also the Montag Hyperflow 360, which no matter how fast we make the fan spin, it never reaches what the LF3 and 360 can do. Seems like the cold plate of the LF3 is just simply better at getting the heat away from that X3D chip. The conclusion for the LF3 and 360 is inevitably the same as for the 240. It's impressive what these things can withstand, but most importantly, the noise to performance ratio of these things is just off the chart. It's not the best 360 AO I've ever seen, so far at least. It is still not beating the unexplainably well-performing Oasis AIO, but uh, pretty much everything else on the market. And the thing about this one is still the price. Between 75 and 90 bucks, give or take, depending on where you buy it and if you want ARGB or not, which is just an unbeatable price. I can get two Liquid Freezer 360s for the price of a single Noctua NHD 15G2, a cooler that is undoubtedly one of the best ones around when it comes to air coolers, but it will never be able to keep up with this 360 millimeter AIO. And considering that, yes, this is a pump, yes, this one can break, but I could buy two of them and just keep one around and then until it breaks and then install the second one and I would still be underneath a Noctua NHD 15 G2. Absolutely amazing job what Arctic pulled off here. I will still favor the 420mm edition just because size and stuff but that's maybe just me and for you if you're looking for one of the best AIOs out there with enough juice to cool down whatever you want the biggest CPUs that are out right now, the LF3 can handle it and the LF3 series is just a safe bet. But okay, this should be everything on the Arctic Liquid Freezer 3 and 360 and an ARGP. And at this point, a huge thank you to Arctic for sending this one over. Oh, on a side note, we have a Discord server. So if you wanna join, the link is down below. And we got channel membership. So if you are planning to sell your soul for an RG poop emoji, that's one way to go. But if not, I'm also releasing the content to all members two or three weeks in advance except for the NDA stuff, because, you know, I, I don't want to get sued. Additionally, you can rest assured that the income will not only keep the channel afloat, but it will also serve to investigate if the European Hardware Awards 2024 is actually just a... a it's just Arctic. I, I don't know, it, it's a bit... They won that pretty often. Anyway, thank you for watching, and if you want to continue, have a look at our take on the Oasis AIO in 360. Still one of the most surprising performers I've had so far. Hope to see you on the next one. Bye-bye.